Well, thank you so much, Jim. Everybody hear me okay? Um, it's, it's just a, it, it's a real pleasure and an honor uh, to be here. And I appreciate that litany of my, uh, my past uh, accomplishments, as it were. Uh, the one thing that was left out, which I think is probably the most relevant to somebody who's trying to write a book about lawlessness and impeachment in the Obama administration, is while I was going to law school and, and college mostly at night, I was a deputy U.S. Marshal in the Witness Protection Program uh, in New York City. So I, if, if I suddenly need to relocate, uh, <laughs> well, we have a camera. Obama's watching right now. So right, come directly right. to him. <laughs> so, but I do have some uh, some expertise in in that regard. The other interesting thing about writing a book about lawlessness in the Obama administration is it's actually a real challenge and, and a real frustration, and that is that. Um, at a certain point in time, the writer simply has to stop writing so that they have time to, you know, stop and find the book and publish it. And the Obama administration goes merrily along. So I think it was probably inevitable that by the time the book came out, I was two or three impeachable offenses behind. Um, and uh, as fate would have it, and I, I, to, to the extent anyone has suggested that I had anything whatsoever as a publicity stunt to do with the trade of uh, Bergdahl for the Taliban fight, that's absolutely untrue. Um, but I, but I, it actually is a, a timely and upsetting episode, and even though it's not something that's covered in the book, it's, it's resonant and redolent of themes uh, that are covered in the book, and I think it's therefore worth uh, a couple of minutes to talk about because I think it launches us into the things that we, we want to discuss today. I've been um, a little taken aback, but maybe not if you think about Washington enough. Maybe I shouldn't have been so much taken aback over what it is that has them spun up in Washington, which is that the president uh, violated this 30-day notification statute. Uh, for, for those who aren't familiar with this, he, there's a law that Congress passed uh, about two years ago in the National Defense Authorization Act that requires, or at least purports to require, the President to give the Congress 30 days notification before it transfers detainees out of Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and that, it is the violation of that statute, of all the things that have happened in the Obama administration, uh, it's the violation of that statute that actually has uh, the likes of um, uh, even Lindsey Graham, for example, uh, saying that it's possible that Obama could be impeached for this kind of conduct. Uh, I, I must say I welcomed his saying that because as I, as I cover in the book, uh, about five or six months ago, there was a hearing on presidential lawlessness in the House of Representatives. I, be I believe it was in, the, uh, in one of the subcommittees of the Judiciary Committee. And you had the oddity of three or four professors, some of whom law professors, who, some of whom were uh, very definitely left of center progressive law professors, talking about how we had a constitutional crisis and that the ultimate constitutional remedy in terms of presidential lawlessness was impeachment. So you have these lefty law professors throwing the word impeachment around the room and these Republican congressmen diving under their desk at the, at the mere mention of it and saying that I word, we don't, we don't say that word up here. So I regard it as progress that Lindsey Graham felt uh, comfortable uttering it a few days ago, even if I think that uh, you know, in, in the greater scheme of things, what he was applying it to uh, was probably trivial. Uh, and I don't mean to suggest that it's, uh, that it's trivial for the, co for the president not to give Congress notice when it's uh, when it's appropriate to give Congress notice, but in the days of the Bush administration, a number of us argued, based on court precedent and the like, uh, that if the president has a power under the Constitution, that cannot be limited or cut back on by a mere statute. The only way that you can cut back on something that's in the Constitution is by amending the Constitution. Uh, so. While anyone who looks at my book will know that I'm hardly a defender of President Obama when it comes to violating statutes, which I think he's done left, right, and center, um, I, I didn't really understand why all of Washington was shrieking over the violation of, of this particular statute, other than perhaps that their pride was hurt. Um, but 
I think a lot more serious things have happened over the last number of years, and frankly, a lot more serious things happen in the four corners of that transaction. This is the trade of a uh, of, of sergeant or a private Bergdahl for the five Taliban commanders. Uh, that seemed to me to dwarf in importance this idea of, of the president violating a statute. You have a situation where the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, one of whose main jobs and obligations is force protection, replenishing the enemy in wartime, and not just replenishing the enemy, replenishing a terrorist enemy with five of its most experienced, most effective, most implacably anti-American commanders, at a time when the Taliban is still conducting offensive jihadist operations against our men and women in the field. That is about as irresponsible a dereliction of duty by the commander-in-chief as I can imagine. I, I have to say that is about uh, as bad a dereliction of duty because, of course, this is the same commander-in-chief who did not come to the aid of Americans who were under terrorist siege in Benghazi. Uh, but I would regard the transfer of enemy commanders to the enemy when the enemy is still conducting operations against our people as of a piece in terms of importance uh, with the derelictions of duty in connection with Benghazi, which are profound. Secondly, you can, you can argue the constitutionality of the substance of the 30-day notification statute. But if you study what the framers had in mind and why they put a, an impeachment clause in the Constitution, uh, one of the things that they were adamant about was that the president had an obligation, a fiduciary obligation, to be forthright with the public and with the Congress. So the president has a right and a, and a power if he truly believes in good faith that a statute is unconstitutional to refuse to execute that statute. After all, the framers were just as worried about the possibility that the Congress would try to consume the powers of the other branches as they were worried about the president usurping power to himself. But one thing that's absolutely clear is that the president is supposed to be forthright in doing it. A, a year ago, almost a year ago to the day, uh, Jay Carney, the president's spokesman, got up in front of the press and the American people and the world and said that they were, had considered the possibility of transferring Taliban operatives back to the Taliban, uh, even in, uh, potentially uh, in exchange for an American. Uh, but they absolutely would not transfer Taliban operatives without consulting with Congress. They said outright that they would comply with the statute. Now, you can argue that the statute is unconstitutional or not, but the president doesn't get to lie about it. The president doesn't get to lull Congress into a false sense of security, as the Obama administration did, and then when it comes time to comply with the statute, uh, actually ignore the statute and do what they did, which is transfer these operatives back to the Taliban. So I don't think that the statute is particularly important, the substance of the statute, but there's no question once you understand what the framers meant by high crimes and misdemeanors, that the dereliction of duty by a commander-in-chief in replenishing the enemy in wartime, uh, and the misrepresentation by the commander-in-chief to Congress about what his intentions were in the handling of enemy combatants are profound offenses against the, uh, against the Constitution. Uh, and those are the things, if I were in, in Capitol Hill today, uh, that I think would be worth getting spun up about. And the other thing that would be worth getting spun up about is that we're now seeing an overloading of the system. I mean, basically what's going on now is think about what's happened the last week. We never even talked about the new EPA regulations that are trying to wipe out vital parts of our economy. Why? Because they, they got sandwiched in between the VA scandal, where, where some of our veterans were, were basically left to die and the government knew about it and has basically covered it up so that they could get their bonuses, right? Um, the VA scandal on one hand and the Taliban and Bergdahl on the other. Uh, and before you can wrap your brain around the Taliban and Bergdahl, 
Now comes the invasion or, or the pouring over our borders of what turned out to be thousands of young illegal immigrant children. So I think what you're starting to see now is a quite intentional effort to overload the system in the sense of we have a finite ability to deal with crisis and what they are doing is being two or three crises down the road before you can even uh, assimilate uh, the one that you're, you're concentrating on in the moment. And the point of my book is that that's a profound threat to liberty. Um, the subtitle of the book seems to be what has gotten uh, a lot of people's hackles up. I can't say as I, I didn't anticipate that that might happen. The subtitle of the book, though, is Building the Political Case for Obama's Impeachment. It doesn't say building the case for Obama's impeachment, and that's quite intentional. The word impeachment seems to be what has people's hackles up, but what I want to focus on, which I, th what I think is the word that's important in the subtitle, is political. Because the central theme of the book is that impeachment is by nature, and in the end, a political remedy, not a legal one. Uh, we, we know that our impeachment standard is high crimes and misdemeanors. We know that in order to carry out impeachment, there's a procedure. There's, a, there's something that's kind of like a grand jury proceeding that goes on in the House of Representatives. They return articles of impeachment which are kind of like an indictment. And then you have something in the Senate which is called an impeachment trial and is kind of made to resemble a regular criminal trial. There's even a judge presiding over it, but it's, it's as I explained in the book, it's very different procedurally than a trial. But I think because of all the legal attendments of impeachment and the fact that we have this high crimes and misdemeanor standard, that people tend to think of impeachment as a legal process, like a, like a trial. And when they hear high crimes and misdemeanors, they tend to think of what we commonly think of as crimes and misdemeanors, the kind of stuff that I used to deal with when I was a prosecutor in New York. It's far, far from that, and I would submit to you that the legal aspect of it is much less important than the political aspect. High crimes and misdemeanors is a term of art that the framers borrowed from British law, and it was, it was a centuries-old concept. And it has precious little to do with what we think of as crimes and misdemeanors. Hamilton described it as the political wrongs of public men. And what it really involves is breaches of fiduciary duty, particularly breaches of the obligations owed by high executive officials in whom great public trust is in debt. And when you, when you see it that way, you realize that much more than a penal code it actually is suggestive of ideas that you hear in the, and think of in the military code of justice. Ideas like dereliction of duty, the failure to honor an oath. And what the framers were most concerned about was presidential lawlessness that threatened our governing structure, particularly the separation of powers. Uh, this is an organization, the Heartland Institute, that is first and foremost about liberty. Uh, the, Separation of powers is what the framers thought was the main protection of our liberties. What they were most afraid of was the accumulation of too much power in one hand, in one set of government hands, particularly the joining of the executive power and the legislative power. And the Constitution is very clearly uh, designed as a mechanism to protect our liberty by dividing power and setting power off against other power so that one set of actors in the government has a motive to make sure that the other set of actors in the government is kept in line. It's one of the major responsibilities of Congress to rein in executive lawlessness. So liberty is, is, is really what this is all about, protecting liberty, and that is what the framers had in mind when they were debating whether to have uh, an impeachment clause. So once you grasp what high crimes and misdemeanors are, this idea that it is a, a profound breaches of the president's fiduciary duty, what the framers would have called maladministration. Uh, it, not just misdeeds that are done out of corruption, but also gross incompetence. 
because they recognized that this powerful presidency that they were creating had the greatest potential to threaten the liberties of our republic. So they wanted to make sure that a person who became president who was ill-suited to the job, whether it was out of malfeasance or, or misfeasance, could be removed. And they thought it was vital to have such a mechanism. So in order to carry that out, they wanted to do two things. First, they wanted there to be a clear legal standard for what was required before you could remove a president. And that's what the high crimes and misdemeanors standard does. And I think when you apply that to what you've seen for the last five and a half years, and I lay this out in the book, it becomes clear that many high crimes and misdemeanors have been committed in the last five and a half years. The second half of the book is an effort to plead articles of impeachment in the manner that a prosecutor pleads an indictment. So the second half of the book, I, I could have done it in a variety of different ways, but I lay out seven proposed articles of impeachment uh, going through the range of activities of the Obama administration. And I try to make it not too much like a, a legalistic document, something that's, uh, that's more readable and thematic, because I think that helps us hammer home uh, what, we've been, uh, what we've been dealing with for the last few years. So for example, all prosecutors want to have a count in the indictment that's pretty bulletproof, you know, one that there's not much of a defense to. So the first article of impeachment uh, that's proposed in the book is the president's failure to execute the laws faithfully. Uh, the president has very few powers that are laid out in the Constitution, but they're crucially important ones to the survival of liberty and the survival of our republic. And the one that's most important domestically uh, is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. The president is the only officer in our government, in our federal government, who is required by the Constitution to take an oath to, to take care that the laws be faithfully executed and to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. I would argue that President Obama's uh, pattern of lawlessness is actually designed with the purpose of undermining uh, our Constitution uh, and not idly undermining it. Uh, you know, I take the President seriously when he said that he wanted to fundamentally transform the United States of America. Uh, it turns out, happily, that most Americans kind of like the United States of America, uh, and we don't want to be fundamentally transformed. Um, if you are hell-bent on transforming the country anyway, and you don't have a legislative majority to do that, you don't have the support of the public to do that, you virtually have to do it by violating the law. Uh, that's the only way that you can accomplish it. And that is what the President has done. Uh, I think that even President Obama's staunchest supporters and most enthusiastic fans would have to admit that he does not follow statutes. Uh, even his own Obamacare statute, uh, when I left New York at 7 o'clock this morning, it had been, I think it had been 30 times unilaterally amended. It's now, I don't know. I, I, all I'm saying is I've been on a plane. I don't know what's going on in Washington the last, uh, last few hours, but, but it, it is that willy-nilly uh, amended. And look, this is what he, he selectively enforces statutes. He ignores them. Uh, he uses the ones that help his enemies, uh, help his friends. Uh, he, he arbitrarily enforces the ones that, uh, that go after his political opponents. Uh, but one thing that, that's very clear is uh, he doesn't seem, he doesn't feel himself bound by them, and he certainly does not faithfully enforce them. And that is his core constitutional duty on the domestic side. So that's one uh, article, um, the, the theme of failing to faithfully execute the laws. There are a couple of other themes, I think, that are, that are very important. Dereliction of duty, which, which I've already mentioned. Uh, not only this business with the Taliban just a few days ago, but the Benghazi massacre, uh, which involves not only the failure to come to the aid of Americans who were under siege, under circumstances where we know that in the first minutes the president knew that they were under terrorist siege, but everything that went on before then. Uh, it's worth taking, uh, talking Benghazi for a moment because I think this gives you an idea of the sweep of what we're talking about in just this one transaction. You'll see in the book I have a, a, a narrative that's stitched together about Benghazi that takes us through a, a, a few varieties of President Obama's lawlessness. 
I take Benghazi back to the unauthorized, unprovoked war that the president started under false pretenses against the Gaddafi regime. I say under false re pretenses because in addition to not having congressional authorization and not going to ask for it, because you would then have to explain why you wanted it, um, President Obama purported to be acting under a UN mandate that only called for the protection of civilians. And he used that as camouflage to make war against Gaddafi's regime, which by the way, at that time, was held out as a key counterterrorism ally of the United States precisely because they were giving us, Gaddafi's regime was giving us intelligence about jihadist activity in eastern Libya, places like Benghazi, where numerous jihadists used uh, Benghazi as a, as a launch point to go to Iraq and make war against uh, American troops there. Uh, so this is a war that was undertaken under false pretenses without any American national interest at stake. And worst of all, I think, under circumstances where it was absolutely clear that one of the fallouts would be the empowerment of Islamic supremacists who are virulently opposed to the United States. That was followed up by what was really a shocking failure to provide security for people who were assigned to Benghazi for reasons that remain mysterious. And that is not just something that went on over, over the course of a few days. Over the months between the end of the war, when, when Gaddafi fell, and the September 11, 2012 atrocity, uh, there were numerous attacks in Benghazi uh, by the people who we basically empowered there. Uh, there were enough attacks, even the even the installation, uh, the mysterious, uh, it was originally called a consulate, it's not a consulate. They now call it, I think, a diplomatic facility. Um, even that installation itself was the target of a bombing that didn't hurt anyone the first time around, although it did blow a hole in one of the retaining walls. The British had the good sense to pull their people out. While the British pulled their people out, our people were asking for more security. Uh, they were not only denied more security, the security was reduced. And what that inevitably led to was the terrorist attack on the 11th anniversary of the 9-11 atrocities. And what followed the terrorist attack under circumstances where we can't yet account for what the president was doing in those hours when Americans were fighting for their lives, the one thing we do know that is clear is that no meaningful action was taken at all to come to their rescue. Um, what they followed that up with was a fraud. This fraudulent idea that the video, the anti-Muslim video that they, um, that probably nobody would even have noticed if the Obama administration hadn't, uh, hadn't brought it to the fore uh, so starkly. Um, a fraud that it was the video rather than a massive failure of Obama's policy of empowering Islamic supremacists that was responsible for the massacre of our people there. And that is a fraud that was not only tirelessly propounded by people in the Obama administration. Uh, the cherry on top, as it were, of, of the fraud is that they trumped up a prosecution against the video producer who had engaged, it doesn't matter what you think of the video, we, we can all stipulate that the video is reprehensible, the ideas that it, that it conveys are, are ugly. It's First Amendment protected activity. But because the guy was on what basically is parole, uh, they exploited the opportunity of, ha of that status to trump up a prosecution against him that was held out to the American people as additional proof that the video had caused the massacre and was held out to people in Islamic countries as an instance of the United States deferring to Sharia blasphemy standards. So if you take this whole transaction from the war all the way through the video fraud, I think you see all of the lawlessness, all of the abuse of power, and all of the fraud that we've come to know in the Obama administration. And I think it sets up the, the, the fraud theme uh, nicely. It's, it's hardly uh, alone. Uh, Benghazi and the fraud theme because, of course, we have things like Obamacare, where the president looks you in the eye and promises you'll be able to keep your plan and keep your doctor, tells you your, uh, your premiums are going down 2,500. 
under circumstances where we now have a paper trail and we know that when they said those things, and not just they, the president also said those things, uh, they knew that they weren't true. Uh, I also have, uh, uh, in addition on the fraud part of it, uh, Solyndra, which is a, a, a very useful little vignette uh, of an area where they made misrepresentations about the health of a business that um, at the time that they knew the business was cratering, where if you had done this in a private industry or in a private corporation that was regulated by the SEC, uh, I don't know, my office, the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York, there's people doing 20, 30 years in jail for that sort of stuff. Um, it, it, it became uh, basically standard fare uh, in this administration. So the articles of impeachment are organized along the lines of lawlessness, failure to um, execute the laws faithfully, uh, uh, derelictions of duty, um, fraud, and uh, abuse of process, the use of the IRS, the use of the Justice Department to punish the president's uh, political foes, and the like. And I think, I hope that when people read it from beginning to end, um, they find it compelling in the sense that, you know, here is what the standard of high crimes and misdemeanors mean. Here is what the president's obligation is to be, uh, to execute the laws faithfully, uh, having a fiduciary responsibility to be straight with the American people and with the other actors in government. And here's the pattern of behavior that we observe over five and a half or six years. And I think, I, I certainly come away from it, and I think many people would come away from it, saying that there have been numerous high crimes and misdemeanors committed. Um, but that's just the legal case. And here we get to the, the second point and the most important point I want to make, which is the political point. The framers, in their genius, wanted there to be a clear standard for what was required to remove a president, but they also wanted to make it hard to do. They wanted to make sure that it could, the president couldn't frivolously be removed, that he couldn't be removed in an exercise of partisan hackery, that it wouldn't be done over just mere ideological uh, disagreements. So the other thing that they put into the Constitution was this requirement that before a president could be removed from power, you have to have a vote, a two-thirds majority of the Senate, that approves it. Um, and what that ensures is that a president cannot be removed from power absent a strong public will, a cross-section of Americans, uh, cutting across ideological lines, cutting across partisan lines, who are of a mind that the lawlessness is uh, so egregious and such a threat to our republic that it can't be tolerated or we can't abide any longer having the president in power. And that is the part that makes uh, impeachment so difficult. I, I told people, you know, when I used to try criminal cases, it was standard fare that, let's say you had a seven count indictment, like I'm talking about seven, char seven articles of impeachment. Um, you'd give the jury special interrogatories that they'd have to fill out. And, you know, they'd have to mark guilty or not guilty, and then they sometimes have to answer some questions because the way the jury found on certain things would, would matter in terms of how much time a person might have to serve in jail or whether there'd be forfeitures and the like. I bet you that I could try the president on the articles of impeachment I've laid out, and I could get on seven counts Guilty, 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 across the board. Um, and then you get to one interrogatory at the end. And do you want him removed from power? And that's the one you lose. And right now, it is the one that would be lost. Because there is no appetite right now in the American people. There's, there's been an appetite uh, in some of the American people for some time uh, that the president is abusive and ought to be removed. But let's face it, uh, the majority of people uh, do not feel that way, at least at this moment. And what I argue in the book, and in book, I should make it very clear, the book is not a call for President Obama to be immediately impeached in the sense of having the House file articles of impeachment. Because I think that the lesson from the Clinton administration, uh, the Clinton impeachment, that we should have learned, rather than the lesson that Washington has learned, which is that impeachment should make you shriek and you should never ever think of it ever, ever again, um, the real lesson of the Clinton impeachment is that not all presidential lawlessness is equal. 
What Obama has done in terms of a thoroughgoing attack on our constitutional framework is very different in kind than Clinton's conduct, which while reprehensible, and I think while it, it certainly merited the, the status of high crimes and misdemeanors, certainly was not a ta an attack on our government governing structure. The lawlessness Obama's engaged in is what the framers were really worried about in terms of preserving our republic. Um, but the other lesson of the of the Clinton administration, uh, the Clinton impeachment, that bears learning and bears emphasizing, is it's a mistake for the House to file articles of impeachment until there is a public will for the removal of the president. Because it, I, I think if you want to impeach the president, the goal has to be to remove the president. The goal is not to have his legacy stained by something that, you know, his supporters are ultimately, like Clinton supporters, going to be able to dismiss as, you know, just a bunch of uh, partisan exhibitionism. The reason to impeach the president is to remove the president. And if there isn't a popular will to remove the president, you not only will not impeach him by filing articles of impeachment, you'll actually unintentionally make things worse. Because what would happen is, you file articles of impeachment, You'd go to the Senate, there'd now be a trial. If the trial were tomorrow, you'd lose the trial, what, 70 to 30? And then the Obama administration and the media would spin that as an endorsement of the way that Obama has governed for the last five and a half or six years. You would have set out to try to crack down on presidential lawlessness, and in the end, the only thing you would have accomplished uh, is encouraging more of it. So let me leave you with this thought before we move to, to questions. What, what the, my book is mainly about is presidential lawlessness. And I think, as I argue in the book, the best thing for the country would not be to impeach President Obama. The best thing for the country would be to create a political environment where he felt the political pressure to conduct himself law, lawfully. Uh, the best thing for the country would be for him to reverse course execute the law faithfully, uh, and finish out his term that way. But if that isn't going to happen, then you can't talk about presidential lawlessness without having impeachment be a serious option that's on the table. Because in the end, the framers only gave us three ways to deal with presidential lawlessness. One of them's gone by the boards already. One of them is elections. There was some thought among the framers that elections themselves would be adequate to, to you know, why did you need to have impeachment in there? Because uh, if a president did anything that was egregious enough, the voters would turn him out, right? Um, that turned out to be a minority position, and I think sensibly, Madison and others retorted that uh, a president who was inclined to be corrupt would have the incentive to be most corrupt if it were to hold on to power. Uh, and I think actually that's exactly what you saw in the run-up to the 2012 election, whether it was the misrepresentations about Benghazi, the misrepresentations about Obamacare, those were designed to tamp things down to get through the election. So I think what we saw in 2012 actually bears out exactly what the framers were talking about. The other two remedies they gave us are the power of the purse and impeachment. And let's face it, the president has had supine opposition over the last five and a half years when it comes to the power of the purse. Part of that is, you know, just plain old fecklessness. Uh, part of it is that Republicans don't, are tired of being demagogued. You know, they don't want to, you know, they're, they're fearful in Washington that every time they oppose the president, they're accused of racism and, you know, every other thing that doesn't have anything to do with the, the issue at the moment that they're, they're trying to raise. But the other problem that we have, and this is one that's going to take a long time to dig out from, when you have a government like ours, an economy like ours, that's now so pervasively run with transfer payments, if the Congress is going to try to use its power of the purse, it's always going to be in a position of, of taking away somebody's goodies. And no one, in, no one in Washington ever wants to be accused of taking the food out of babies' mouths and the, uh, the subsistence away from people who need it. Uh, so in many ways, unfortunately, the way our, our, our dysfunction in Washington now doesn't work, um, the power of the purse has become almost illusory. In fact, we saw the one time they actually tried to use the power of the purse to prevent Obamacare from being implemented, uh, the conservatives in the Senate and the House who tried to do that 
were actually almost run out of town by their own party. It wasn't even just the media and the Democrats, it was other Republicans who, uh, who rejected it. So if the uh, elections are not an option and the power of the purse is illusory, what we're left with is impeachment. And you can decide not to impeach the president. Um, it's a political choice, and it's actually it's it's not a frivolous political choice. There's a you know there's a lot of good re ra uh, good reasoning behind why you wouldn't do it. My point is that we need to do these things with our eyes open. If you're not going to use the tools that the framers gave us to fight back against presidential lawlessness, what you're not only going to have is unremitting presidential lawlessness, you're going to have an erosion of your liberty because it's going, what it ultimately does is it accretes power to the president at the expense of the other branches. It eviscerates the separation of powers uh, and it, it does away with the things that protect our liberty. We're no longer than a republic under the rule of law. We're subjects of presidential whim. And the reason I think that this is something that isn't a conservative issue, and it's not a Republican issue, it's an American issue, is the, pres the precedents that are being set now by the lawlessness that President Obama has engaged in are going to be available to every future president, regardless of party and regardless of ideological bent. So it's something that we all have a stake in. But I think in terms of building the political case for impeachment, which is, which is again, back to the subtitle of the book, you don't want to let the impeachment cart get in front of the lawlessness horse. The only way that you're going to build a political climate uh, that, that even takes seriously the possibility of removing a lawless president from power is if we make clear to the public that everybody has a stake in lawlessness. What I've tried to do in the book is harness all the lawlessness in one place. You know, it comes to us in such a diffuse way. It seems like there's several episodes uh, a week. I tried to pull it all together in one place, and most importantly, tried to show how it's a threat to our liberties and how it's a threat to our republic. Um, if you don't make the case on lawlessness, then I don't think that there's any way that you can even ever talk realistically about impeachment. So what I'm hoping is that we can change the climate so that we can get back to being a republic based on the rule of law. And that's my modest objective for the book. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. On this. On the IRS, Andy, uh, you know, we hear <coughs> certain bits of information, certain bits of information dribbling out the other day. We read that uh, Lois Lerner gave illegally information to the FBI, a million pages or something. Right. A um, couple questions. One, why hasn't she been given immunity yet? And then the follow-up question is, who makes that decision? Is it one or more committees? And if she is given immunity, she then to post for days and that transcript make public? How would that play out? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, I've uh, written about this a bit because it seems to me that um, this, is an, this is a real demonstration of why the committee structure in Congress is not equipped to investigate things that really need to be investigated as if a grand jury was doing the investigation. Congress, when it investigates things, these committees do it through the prism of whatever, whatever their jurisdiction is. So they not, there's not one of them that has a mission whose, whose job is to basically get to the bottom of what happened and then we'll figure out you know, whose jurisdiction is, is triggered by it. Um, which is why the select committee on Benghazi is so important and why I think that structure, the select committee structure, is going to have to be replicated through a lot of these episodes of, uh, of, of lawlessness. Um, so here's, because we're stuck with this structure, what happened with Lois Lerner is we spent essentially a year on the abstruse legal question of did she waive her Fifth Amendment privilege or didn't she? Um, rather than talking about the outrageous facts of the FBI, of the IRS investigation. I mean, I won't bore you with this, but th there's, a, there's a doctrine of law that says uh, if you if you give testimony voluntarily, then you've waived your right to claim a Fifth Amendment privilege and not be cross-examined on it. But there's a lot of differences in the cases about, about what 
kind of a how much of a statement that you have to give before you you're deemed to waive. So, for example, if you go up, if you get up and say, "I'm not guilty," uh, that's not a waiver. Uh, if you give a chapter and verse explanation of your exculpatory or purportedly exculpatory conduct, that is a waiver. And then there's what Lerner did, which is kind of in the middle. She did more than just a, a summary, I'm not guilty, but she did less than uh, a full explanation of what her conduct was. So as a result, you had this long business of, you know, did she wave or didn't she wave? And what happened while that whole misdirection was going on? Remember when this first got disclosed, President Obama said it was outrageous and unacceptable conduct. Well, while everybody was looking at the shiny object, which was uh, Lois Lerner's uh, Fifth Amendment privilege, the administration quietly went about trying to put into regulations the very misconduct that the president said was outrageous and unacceptable. Uh, so I, I think that whole thing has been a farce, and it's not going to be investigated uh, competently until they get out of the structure that they're in. She should have been immunized. She should have been immunized, you know, probably a week or two after she did that whole uh, theatrical statement that they argued about whether she had she'd waved over or not. Uh, the, way, the reason I say she should have been immunized is, you know, as a prosecutor, you look for the person who is like the nexus between this level of player and this level of player, and she's that person. And frankly, from my, from my perspective, for and I think this should be from everybody's perspective. We're, we're too legalized or, or litigious a society. It doesn't matter if Lois Lerner goes to jail or not. In terms of our, of our body politic and getting to the bottom of the abuse of power, we need the information. We don't need her in jail. So getting to the bottom of what happened is much more important than whether she goes to jail or not. And if you gave her immunity, if she obstructed the investigation or she committed perjury afterwards, she could be prosecuted for that. And the penalties for those things are probably more severe than anything she'd be looking at if you actually prosecuted her for what she did at the IRS. So she's a classic case of someone who should be immunized. What would have to happen is the House would have to vote to immunize her. It wouldn't, have to, it wouldn't be a committee. It would have to be uh, the full House. And they could do that. They just haven't gotten around to it. Um, and I don't think they're going to, the, I, that investigation right now is lagging. And I don't think there's going to be any push to it or direction to it until, uh, until they do something about loosening her um, uh, resistance to testify. Yes, ma'am? Um, when our founders created the system of checks and balances, two assumptions they made was that there would be a free and objective press and that you'd have to a Congress that would be concerned about their power. Clearly, we've had problems with both of those. And as you pointed out, the key to making a case for impeachment, um, political or otherwise, is getting the public on your side. But when you've got ideologues in two of the most powerful parts of our, our country fighting against that, I think it, it's a big problem. I just wonder how important you think those two issues are. The, highly supine and biased Congress and a similar free press are in impeding this, uh, yeah. this in effort. Incredibly uh, serious problems. Uh, Richard Nixon, in November 1972, won what turns out to be the second largest uh, electoral landslide in the history of American uh, presidential politics. Right? 20 months later, he was gone. Now, if you look at what his re-election margin was, it dwarfs Obama's support when he was re-elected. Uh, and he couldn't survive 20 months because once people became riveted to presidential lawlessness, he couldn't survive politically. The difference, of course, is the media was Nixon's day-after-day -day prosecutor, and today the media is Obama's Praetorian Guard. So while I, I don't think the, the media is not as powerful as it, it, it doesn't have the, the uh, monopoly that it had in 1972. It's a much more varied media than it is now. It's still an enormous problem. I, I, the way I, I like to think of it is this. When the media floats a story that's false, we in the alternative media now are good at shooting that down. Like that Dan Rather uh, fraud about, uh, about Bush, 
I think the, the ink was still wet on it when, when it got shot down as something that was incredible. So if they try to do something that's totally fraudulent, that can be shot down. Where the media is still really powerful is that there's a true story that cries out to be told. They can refuse to cover it. And I think that's really a lot of what they've done in connection with the Obama administration. Uh, so the media continues to be a big problem. Um, and the other aspect of it is the, the framers did not, um, the framers were worried about factionalism. And I think they've been proved prescient by the modern left in this regard. Our system is based on the idea that if, if that everyone will protect their institutional turf. And what I mean by that is, if the president usurps the powers of the legislative branch, the idea was that somebody in the House or somebody in the Senate would see themselves as a senator or a, or a member of Congress first and a Democrat second, and they would protect the institution. What the modern left does, by contrast, is they're not interested in the institutions. They're trying to break down all the institutions. So what, what leftists in government do, and I'm not making a blanket statement about all Democrats, but there are a lot of movement leftists in the, in the Democratic Party. Um, what they do is they gravitate to whatever the center of power in government is that is most capable of moving their ideological agenda up the field. And they not only exploit it, they protect it. And if they have to, if, if, if it's the president and the president has to go outside the law, they back them and they support them. I saw that there was a, you know, some Democratic congressman yesterday took to the floor of the House to say that, you know, if we don't enact some kind of uh, a comprehensive, uh, sorry, Mr. President, <laughs> um, if we don't enact some kind of uh, comprehensive immigration reform, then the president has his pen and he has his phone and he's going to have to just do it unilaterally. So, you know. You've got legislators that are calling for the president to ignore Congress. That is not the way our system is supposed to work, and that's why the framers are so worried about factions. Yes, so, in your opinion, where do we Americans who have our pitchforks sharpened go? I mean, where, what can we, I mean, seriously, do we can sit here and talk all day long about his breaking the law and his lying and his dereliction of duty? Who in Washington gets it, or where do we go? Because I think there are a lot more Americans walking around that want him out than there are people in Washington. There are a lot more Americans who want him out than there are people in Washington, but there are not enough Americans that want him out that it makes sense to file articles of impeachment. So it's this, hopeless. This no, it's not hopeless. What, what I'm, I hope it's not hopeless. I mean, if it's, if it's hopeless, then I, so I, just, we I wasted so a lot of time. What do we do? We have to win the battle of public opinion on the issue of lawlessness. We can't, it, it can't just be a continuing, you know, one episode of lawlessness happens and then a few days later there's another episode of it and they're disconnected and nobody ever connects them up. What I'm trying to do with the book and what I'm trying to suggest to people is that the lawlessness of the president as a package is something that threatens our rule of law, our liberties, and our republic. And that, it, what, what has to happen is people in Washington, you know, what I've been dismayed about in the last week is they say, well, no, impeachment, I'm not interested in impeachment. I, I, you know, we got uh, midterm elections coming up, that's not No one is saying impeach the president now. What they're saying is, let's make a big issue out of lawlessness now. Lawlessness is a winning issue for the president's opposition. And I, you hear very few of them talking about it. They let these issues come at them one at a time. I think you've got to make a big issue out of lawlessness and try to shame Obama. You either shame Obama into becoming lawful or you shame the political class into doing something about it. Uh, but you've got to make a big stink about it. If, if you don't make a big stink about things, they, don't, they just don't get attention. Yes, ma'am. I have questions. Regarding, um, regarding Benghazi mm -hmm. and not coming to the aid of the people in Benghazi, cutting back the rules or changing the rules of engagement for the military, and lastly, this, this trade with the terrorists. At what point is treason put on the table? Because I'm not hearing that word, and why is it happening being discussed? Boy, I thought, yeah. I, I thought I was the nut with impeachment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look, um, tre treason is giving aid and comfort 
to the enemies of the United yeah, States. Yeah. Yeah. And uh -huh. I don't know what you call replenishing the Taliban when they're still shooting at our guys. So, um, but, but yeah. you know, treason, uh, what, what the Constitution says is treason, bribery, and, and high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, I don't see any more of a groundswell to go after President Obama for treason than I do for high crimes and misdemeanors. But I think if we can convince them, can convince the public on one or the other, then uh, you know maybe we we've got something. In your opinion, based on again change of the rules and engagement for the soldiers in Afghanistan, and based on this pattern of behavior, in your opinion, because common sense tells me, you know, treason's treason. I mean, can't be any more anti-American. Right. In my opinion, has President Obama committed treason? Yeah, yeah, I know. It's um, I'm not prepared because I'm a lawyer. I'm a weasel. Uh, no, no, uh, no. Because I'm a lawyer, treason has a has a mental component, just like all crimes do. Uh, this is this is hard for me to to wrap my brain around. I'm sure it's going to be hard for most people in this room to wrap their brain around. But President Obama actually thinks. Okay. And this is this to me is more crazy than uh, than insidious, or more naive than insidious. They actually think that trading commanders to the Taliban and doing things like not labeling them a terrorist organization, which they've resisted doing, even though their terrorism is the reason that we're we supposedly that, that's supposed to be the reason why we still have people in uh, in Afghanistan. That ultimately, this will convince them to come to the table and negotiate with the Afghan government that we've backed all this time, and that will create the final, uh, what do they call it, the reconciliation process that will, that will lead to the final settlement where we can walk away from Afghanistan with our heads held high because they've got a reconciliation government. Now, yeah, yeah. But, right. Insanity is a defense, by the way. Um, it's not a it's not a defense to impeachment, though. It's an imp only to indictment. Um, so the reason I, I, I look, I every every crime has a has an act and a mental state, right? And they and you get drummed into you if you do what I used to do for 20 years that you have to prove both. And if the only if the only thing you had to prove the, was the act, and the only act was if you give aid and comfort to the enemy, uh, especially during wartime, they've given aid and comfort to the enemy. Uh, I like high crimes and misdemeanors better than treason because you have to prove that someone's intentionally treasonous. Whereas with high crimes and misdemeanors, it doesn't matter if they're corrupt or incompetent; they're gone if they're not, if they're the wrong people. But you got to convince people first. Um, so, yeah. so my, uh, my neighbor actually said it was treason. He's the same guy who says global warming may be a hoax. I didn't mm -hmm. say it. My right. neighbor said it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, looked you up I have Wikipedia. this friend, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I looked you up on Wikipedia, and yeah. I just want to say I liked you in uh, Pretty in Pink and seen Apple the Fire. <laughs> and not in Weekend and Burnings. I did not like that. Right. Weekend and Burnings. But it turned out that's not you. That's the Grant Pack. Yay, imagine. Andrew McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and question, what was the what was the Jacqueline Bissett movie you mentioned? Our class, first movie he was in, they had a scene in Water Tower Place in an elevator I won't go into. So <laughs> it's gotta be better it's gotta be better than Molly Ring Ringwall movie. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> so my question actually quick statement, I think you'd be a good attorney general. Thank you. And uh, I, I'm content at this point to stay one step ahead of indictment, but then <laughs> So two weeks ago, Obama was in town raising money, and he was with In this town? <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> I saw his motorcade. Right, right. Uh, but he was raising money. The guy held a $35,000 plate cocktail party, a wind turbine guy. So to me, this seems like a Salandra deal. I mean, how is it nobody is outraged by something like this? And is he just untouchable on these yet another small scale? I don't, you know, look, I don't think he's untouchable. You see what's happening in the opinion polls. But I do think, and this goes to what I said at the beginning, I do think, um, remember the, the old uh, Cliven, uh, Piven Cloward strategy? I always get the, the Piven Cloward strategy. I think that that's a, a breed of that is what you're seeing. They're overloading the system. Nobody gets too outraged about any one thing, unless it's like totally egregious and, and commands the headlines for a few days, like the Taliban thing. And by the way, I think with the Taliban thing, I hate, I hate to say this, but over, um, over the last 
20 years, we've had so many Muslim names associated with anti-American terrorism that I don't think what's grabbed the public's attention are, are these five Taliban guys because they're just five more anti-American Muslim extremists. What's really grabbed the public's attention is Bergdahl more than anything else. And I think the reason for that is, uh, and you always uh, get taught you get taught this uh, when you're uh, learning how to try cases, you never want to um, pretend in front of the jury that something or someone uh, is something that he's not. And I think what they tried to do was paint Bergdahl a certain way and that story just got obliterated within uh, within hours. And that's what people are more, I'm sorry? I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I think that's what got people's uh, attention. But the, the real syndrome is that there's so much of it and there's so many different instances of it, instances of it that I think it's hard for people to you know, focus on one thing. Yes, sir? So I'm not sure what you, I, I, it's very clear you're saying this is a political argument that you have to make you have to persuade Democrats to join with Republicans and convict Obama in the Senate trial. So it's a political question, right? Well, at the very least, you have to convince at least people in the center and people on the left that they have a stake in lawlessness and change the political climate. Uh, and you don't even get into the ballpark of impeachment without that. And, and you talk about the Taliban and this trade as abuse of power and lawlessness. Right. But somebody like Charles Krauthammer, who's fairly uh, recognized as a good, intelligent conservative, seems to have said, this is a constitutional power that the president has. He differs with him, but he is commander in chief. And so this is a political question, I think Krauthammer would say. All right. And you're going to have to take that and a number of other things and say, no, it, not, you're going to have to persuade Charles and other Democrats that this is a political issue. So maybe you could just talk a little bit more about that because that's that seems like a very high hurdle to yeah. say it's lawlessness, it's not a political difference. Well, a, a large variety of what the president's wrongdoing is is lawlessness. Some of it is dereliction of duty, which is not necessarily technically lawless because these are duties the president has. It's just that they're performed either corruptly or uh, incompetently. I responded to uh, Charles on the Taliban. I actually wrote a, uh, a column about that at National Review last week. I think he's just dead wrong on this, and he's conflating uh, a couple of importantly different concepts. He basically says that, you know, look, these are trades that we do, and we do it because of our respect for life and the value that we place on human life. And I think what Charles is uh, con conflating is there's a, there's a difference between the way you treat enemy combatants at the end of a conflict and in the middle of a conflict. At the end of a conflict, you don't have a right to hold enemy combatants that you can't charge with other crimes, so you have to release them, even if you're dealing with a non-state actor like the Taliban. In the middle of a conflict, you don't release commanders to the enemy um, if the enemy is still conducting operations against our side and we still have men and women at risk. And if the idea is our veneration of human life, there's nothing there's nothing that venerates human life in turning five terrorists over so that they can mass murder civilians. That's a in my mind that's a that's a that's a backward calculus. However, let me just address the, the political um, aspect of this. A president can be impeached over over a decision that he has an absolute right to make. As a, as a matter of, uh, of politics and the Constitution. I wish I had thought of this, but um, I have to credit Judge Mukasey with this. Um, Judge Mukasey was uh, interviewed on Fox News over the weekend, and he explained it this way. He said, the president under the Constitution has the pardon power. He has an absolute unreviewable power to pardon. Okay? If he tomorrow came into the office and said, I'm pardoning every single prisoner in federal custody. All the thousands of them, I don't care what they've committed, everybody's released. He would have the absolute unreviewable power to do that. It would be totally constitutional, it would be totally within his authority to do it, and he'd be impeached the next day, I'm pretty sure. Even even the left would, would have to say that that was a, a, a gross abuse of power. 
So what the framers were concerned about was uh, not just illegality. In fact, it's important to note that impeachable offenses don't have to be indictable offenses. Uh, they are breaches of fiduciary duty, and they very often will not involve uh, actual felony crimes or misdemeanors. Time for a few more questions. OK. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there was a caller to Martha Lamin's program that raised an interesting point, and I'm wondering where you see Eric Holder in this scenario. Uh, he said that, well, we all recall, Holder uh, granted pardon to the FALN terrorists caught in this fair city to some extent right. uh, and uh, incarcerated, but released just in time for Hillary's election. So that was the one batch of terrorists that Holder's fingerprints were on. And now this group of terrorists, whom um, Ms. Rice said had passed on the um, action as being uh, uh, you know, permissible. So do you see Holder as an actor in this, or just a volunteer? One of the things I didn't cover in my remarks that I should have is that uh, aside from um, trying to ensure that the uh, separation of powers was protected. Um, one of the things the framers were really concerned about was accountability in the executive branch. Um, if you look at the Constitution, all of the executive power is vested not in you know, multiple heads, not in this vast expanse of uh, executive agencies in the administrative state. What the Constitution said is, says is that all of the executive power of the United States is vested in one President of the United States. It's, it's all vested in one officer. Um, now, that wasn't idly done. There was a lot of debate about the structure of what the executive branch should be. And there, they talked about like a committee. They talked about like a triumvirate, uh, a two-headed thing. They ultimately decided if we repose all the power in one person, that person is accountable for everything that happens in the executive branch. And we'll never be able to say, oh, well, that was Susan Rice, or that was Eric Holder, or that was, you know, as, they, as the framers put it, they're sub-adjutants or co-adjutants. Um, the idea was the president is responsible for everything that happens in the executive branch. And that is true. You know, it's not Hillary, it's not Shinseki, it's not uh, Rice or Powers or whoever else. The president is, it's as if the president did those things himself, and it's especially as if the president had did, done those things himself if his reaction to their maladministration is to protect them and promote them rather than to fire them. So, you know, I know, I, I'm, I'm no uh, Holder fan. Uh, I actually was a, kind of a lone voice in the wilderness arguing hard that he shouldn't be confirmed. Um, and it's not just the FALN terrorists. On Clinton's last day in office, he also pardoned two of the Weather Underground terrorists. Uh, and that was on the basis of this kind of offline pardon process that, uh, that Holder put together for him, that the pardon process that was outside the regular DOJ pardon process. Everybody thinks of the Mark Rich pardon because that was so outrageous. They missed the two Weather Underground people. So I think. They've been, they have a, a pattern of being irresponsible when it comes to um, the security of the American people and the, the evil of our enemies. To the point where even Hillary, I, I, I read uh, uh, was it a day ago or two days ago, she said, oh, those Taliban guys, they're not a threat to the United States. They're a threat, they're a threat to Afghanistan. And I sort of thought that the reason we were in Afghanistan was because the last time the Taliban took over there, they gave Al-Qaeda safe haven, and then Al-Qaeda was able to project power. And there was, there was a big hole in my city uh, down in, in lower Manhattan on account of that for you know a number of years. So it, it's kind of shocking to me that, that, that uh, they could delude themselves that way. But they have a pattern of doing it for years. Plus, it's throwing the alien. Yeah. Do you read a book, Department of Injustice? I have, yes. That's a great book. You should tell her to read that. Yeah. yeah, Christian Adams. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's about 1,200 pages. Here. It's a good one, though. Yeah. Everything's put on No. So, so Andy has enough time to sign books. We have time for one more question. Uh, <laughs> I pick. All right, there's two, there's two hands up. Let's try to do two quick. All right. It really seems that the media is the one responsible for the laws. Why is there any attempt to really go after you know, Brian Williams and uh, David Parker, all these people 
who should be doing the job that you're doing. And what was the other question back there? Somebody had a hand up. There. No, no, I'll answer both of them. I just want to get them both. Exactly right Yeah, well, I, uh, let me answer the second one first. I, I'm, I agree with Justice Scalia that you know the 17th Amendment is where it all went off the rails because right. the, the Washington became much less responsive to the states uh, afterwards. But I still think that we get the Senate performance that we deserve. Um, you know, if, if when Obama first came in, when he was at the zenith of his popularity, and the Democrats had a lock on both the Senate and the House, he wanted to close Gitmo, and he wanted to give KSM a trial, a civilian trial in Manhattan, and he wasn't able to do it because there was public outrage over it. That lit a fire under Congress, and he wasn't able to do it, even though he had everything politically seemingly going for him. And that gives me a ray of hope that the system is still responsive if people get active and engaged, but you have to get them uh, active and engaged. And on the media, I think we are in the process of doing what you're talking about. Their ratings are in the tank. Uh, you have one after another of these big newspapers and magazines uh, going out of business. Um, didn't NBC just hire you know, like a, a bunch of shrinks to go out and talk to Brian Williams' family to find out like why he's not likable. David Gregory's. David Gregory's. Um, the New York Times still has world influence. It doesn't matter how many people quit. Everybody at university and media and Hollywood has world they get their news from the New York Times. Well, not yeah, but there's there's a there's kind of a New York Washington corridor that they have a hammerlock on, and I I think there's a big old country out there that they're less and less important to. It's frustrating to us because. They punch. They still punch above their weight, and they have so, so much more influence than, um, than, than support for what their pieties are. Uh, so it's it's irritating and frustrating to have them call the tune so much, and they really can squelch a story that deserves to be covered, and that's that remains a big problem. But if you if you take the long view on this, and I think it's the only thing we can take, things are so much better now than they were, you know, 25 years ago when there was only, you know, the three networks and the Washington Post and the New York Times. We actually have uh, the, the capacity to fight back now. And if you think about it, elections like the 2010 election, and I think the elections like we're going to have in 2014, don't happen uh, without the fact that we have a very diverse media now. Those, those elections are happening in spite of the media. So. You know, they're a big obstacle, but it's not like they're an insuperable obstacle. Two words, Dave Brock. Yeah, that's right. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>